Welcome everyone uh, to our webinar today, which is on what you should know about digital learning in 2019. Uh, we'll, do, we'll do introductions in uh, just a second, or right now. Yeah, okay. we can do introductions right now. Uh, I'm Kelly Aidy. I'm the Director of Instructional Strategy for Schoology, and I'm joined actually by Joe Vasallo, uh, who I'll let introduce himself. Go ahead, Joe. Hi, I'm Joe Vasallo. I'm a Product Engagement Specialist here at Schoology. Um, been with Schoology for about three years now, and uh, it's a great place, and I love what we're doing here. So we're going to do some uh, some really interesting conversation around. We're going to do some conversation <laughs> around <laughs> around uh, digital learning and a survey that we sent out. And I hope you guys enjoy and uh, what we have to go over. Um, I'm having trouble showing my screen. Oh. Oh, Dwayne just asked if the presentation will be shared. Could it be used to present to students, parents, and staff? Uh, actually, that's a great question. We will be sending out uh, at the end of the webinar. It'll take, I don't know how long it'll take to get from our marketing team. You'll get an email that said, thanks for attending. And there'll be a link to the actual recorded webinar. And we'll also be sending along the full report of the survey that we actually gave out. So what we're doing today is Joe and I are talking about highlights from that survey, but there's a ton more information in that actual report. So you'll get the full PDF uh, as well as the recording. All right, so I've got our agenda pulled up here. We've uh, already gone through introductions, but we have to address the most important elephants in the room, and it's why do Kelly and I look alike? It's because <laughs> Kelly told me how to dress today. Uh, so we are wearing the same exact <laughs> outfit, though um, provided by different uh, designers, I'm sure. But that's not entirely true. The truth is, every now and then, Joe and I show up wearing shockingly similar clothing, despite our height difference and our gender difference. So. And I've said it before, I'll say it again, great minds dress alike. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we need to say about that. Uh, all right, so today we're going to be covering, we've already gone through our introductions. We're going to be taking a look at interesting insights for teachers, um, as well as interesting insights that came from our survey for admins, um, and general insights around learning, uh, professional developments, and challenges that are arising in K-12 education. Yeah. Um, and we'll go over some key takeaways. So I'll get us to the next, uh, that's us. Um, so I'm going to let Kelly was this. Yeah, yeah, I'll talk about this because last year uh, we did a similar survey and we also did a webinar talking about those results. So what we did this time, this is still going to be a general study of kind of digital learning and the state of digital learning in K-12. We conducted this one from May through June of 2018 and it was shared in a variety of, of ways, uh, especially in social media. So last year, we got about 2,300 responses, which we were really happy about. This year, we got over 9,000. So we had a huge jump in participation this year, which was really interesting for us. 71%, 71.7 rather percent of those were teachers and 28.3 were administrators. And when we say administrator, we're really talking about those that are in a leadership role in a district, not necessarily a system admin. As you know, with ed tech, admin can mean different things. We're talking more about the school administrator side uh, of those respondents. Yeah, it's a, a really exciting growth from what we had last year. Yeah, we should have had a chart showing <laughs> a huge spike. Yeah, I always like visuals. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, so um, we'll talk a little bit why we did the survey. Yeah, so just like last year, Obviously, we're passionate about ed tech and ed tech in the K-12 space, but we also wanted to think about some assumptions and some things that we kind of hear out there in terms of rumor or presumed fact. Uh, let's highlight what the reality was based on what the respondents told us versus what might be an assumed reality, things that we perceive to be true, but maybe the numbers don't show us that. And then also, really to provide a foundation to think about future initiatives, things that may be something to keep an eye on, uh, as we move forward uh, into this year. And then, of course, we'll repeat this again next year. It'll be very interesting to see, first of all, how much bigger it gets in terms of our respondents. And also, we are going to be able to start tracking our that data over time, which is also really exciting. Yeah, so tell your friends. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, let's uh, address how we did the survey. So, uh, like I said, we actually targeted, you know, obviously the digital, the ed tech space. So we had a team of former educators, former administrators, content specialists, 
go through and basically design these questions. And this was a process that we actually started last year when we first did the survey. And as I said, we promoted this digitally through uh, email, blog posts, social media, um, even word of mouth, Joe just said, tell your friends. Uh, and then we also used, and it says here logic was used, what that means is we had branching questions, meaning that if we asked if you were a teacher or an administrator, depending on your response, you were given a separate set of questions. So branching logic was actually included as part of the survey. Right. And we'll take a look at who participated in our survey. So um, not super surprising, uh, out of our approximately 9,000 respondents to the survey, 88% um, of that is uh, public K-12, and 12% of that was private K-12. Um, that makes, it's pretty much aligned with what we would expect um, at this point. Yeah, and actually, one thing that we're curious about, especially for those of you that are joining us today, we're actually going to put up a poll because we would love to know if you were actually one of the participants uh, in this year's survey. So we'll just give a couple of seconds. Please uh, select one of the following. Uh, did you take the survey in 2018? This is always a place we need music. This is the place we need music. <laughs> Maybe Jeopardy music. I can make that happen. I bet you could, actually. You'd probably write the music. I could do that, too. I'm sure you could. Okay, let's go ahead and see what our responses were. Okay, 7% of you took the poll. That's actually cool. It'll be interesting to see if the answers that you gave are actually aligned with some of the kind of overall data that we got. But we also have a large number who didn't take it. So this may be the first time you're seeing some of these questions. I think especially for those of you that didn't take it, it'll be really interesting to take a look at the entire report. So you'll see all the questions that we asked along with a little bit more disaggregation of that data. So we're going to be presenting data in kind of a global view, but we actually did, you know, kind of break things down by role for administrators especially and uh, for grade level and for size of districts. So all that will be included uh, in that report. And then some of you can't remember, that's okay. Uh, we'll go over what those questions were uh, at a high level today. All right, yeah, and um, I, I would just to uh, echo some of Kelly's sentiment, I didn't take the poll, um, but I went through a lot of these questions and thought the the data that came back was really interesting. So yeah. there's a lot of questions that arise from from the data that I think are, that I know are definitely worth exploring. Yeah, and actually when Joe and I are going through some of it, we ended up, uh, having a lot of actually deeper conversations as we were preparing the slides about what some of the data revealed. Yeah. All right. So uh, the survey was broken down um, so that we could disaggregate particular data points um, by admin, not admin role in Schoology, but the type of role that you would have in your organization. So if you're a superintendent, if you're involved in curriculum and instruction, if you're if you designate yourself as IT, um, we took that as admin and have further breakdowns um, under that admin category. So we're really able to get data around those different categories. And we did an instructor breakdown as well um, by grade uh, segment. And uh, most of our uh, instructor responses were from the secondary level, which also I would, I would, I'm not too shocked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and insights around the U.S. If you're in one of these regions, you can see how many people responded from that particular region. I think something else that's worth noting, you know, while we promoted this in terms of social media and email and word of mouth, uh, we actually got a huge percentage of respondents that aren't customers of Schoology. So this is not a Schoology specific survey by any means. I think we had around 70% of the respondents that weren't customers of Schoology currently and about 30% that were. And uh, if you're in that yellow region, 17.4%, tell your friends. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to take a look at interesting insights for for teachers. And I'm just going to jump ahead right next, right to this uh, next slide, and let Kelly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Let Kelly, go, go, so, go over some of this. One, so the question that we asked was, what are some of the biggest learning challenges that you faced uh, in the previous school year? So the responses that we got uh, were not that different from what we got last year. One of the biggest challenges being you know, juggling multiple technology tools. And, you know, if you're a teacher, you know how there are so many great things out there, 
that often trying to find how those work together and how those blend into kind of a cohesive plan can be definitely a challenge. Um, also, student access to technology was a challenge. Uh, integrating ed tech tools into the classroom. And then uh, for the fourth one, the lack of time during normal business hours. And I think that time, I mean, honestly, that comes up with almost everything we ask, whether it's curriculum implementation, professional development, time seems to be always uh, a challenge, e digital or not. Uh, time is just something that's in precious commodity, so. Yeah, and, and we're gonna mention this a little bit further down the line, uh, not too far down the line. But a lot of these challenges, um, if you look at them yourself and you use Schoology in, in, in the classroom or you have, uh, or you're an administrator that that's, has a district that's using Schoology or a building that's using Schoology, um, a lot of these challenges are addressed by an LMS such as Schoology. Uh, so that is, that's good news. So tell your friends. That's going to be my theme of this. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, because we'd asked teachers what their biggest challenge was, another thing that we asked was, what do you think one of the biggest barriers or obstacles is for student learning. So we had a lot of you hadn't responded to the survey, so we wanted to actually see what you could predict. So we're gonna post a poll, and it's going to have our top five responses to that question, obstacles to student learning. We're gonna ask you to actually predict what the second highest response was uh, for that particular question. So of these five, which one do you think was the second highest? And we'll give just a couple of seconds to go ahead and have you respond to that one. Okay, let's go ahead and end the poll and see what the responses were. Okay, so the top vote getter for what was the second highest was lack of student access at home. Interestingly, that was actually the top vote getter. Uh, lack of student access actually was the highest obstacle that people identified uh, in terms of students in digital learning. But let's go ahead and actually see what that second highest one was on the slide. All right, so second highest obstacle was insufficient time to teach individual students who need it the most. And again, this is probably not just an obstacle for digital learning. I think that's something that we as teachers struggle with all the time is how do we provide that individualized attention for students that need it? whether that's something that's additional support or even something that students may have moved beyond where uh, their peers are, we need to provide them with something extra. Other obstacles that were identified in terms of those top five, uh, not enough devices. So in addition to having a lack of access at home for students, students not having enough actual devices for them um, actually at school is also one of those barriers. Uh, discipline issues and then poor or unreliable network connections. I will say that I think trend-wise, we're seeing that bandwidth is becoming less of an issue, especially when we're looking at districts and what they're able to provide actually on site. But there's also some really interesting things happening when you look at uh, kind of creative ways that districts are trying to address that lack of, of especially internet access at home with things like uh, roving buses that have Wi-Fi hotspots. I think everyone recognizes that the connection to the internet is really critical for digital learning to really happen in a kind of in a consistent way. And so it'll be interesting to see over time if that, you know, those unreliable network connections, if that number begins to significantly drop as more investments are made uh, into those Wi-Fi infrastructures, both in communities and at our schools. Yeah, I mean, I've always said there should be three things that are free in life, air, water, and Wi-Fi. <laughs> I mean, truly, it's, it's, it's a currency. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, hopefully we get there at some point. Yeah. I don't need to get on that soapbox because <laughs> then we'll be here too long. All right, so we definitely also want to talk about, you know, we talked about uh, TPAC before on our webinars, and we have blog posts about TPAC. If you don't know what, what TPAC is, it's actually a model uh, designed to think about uh, different ways that teachers need to think about integrating technology into the larger context of teaching and learning. And some of you have probably heard of the SAMR model. Uh, SAMR is obviously a widely used model for kind of the progressions or levels of, of tech integration. 
What I think I really appreciate about TPAC is it goes a little bit deeper into thinking about the different domains of knowledge that are needed to really effectively teach with digital tools. So obviously there is a technology component uh, where you have to understand how the technology works, but that has to work in concert with your content knowledge and also with your pedagogical knowledge. So that's where the, the term TPAC comes from. It's the you know technology, pedagogy, content knowledge kind of construct. So we were just talking about device access and la lack of devices and lack of Wi-Fi, uh, not having enough time. So when we think about other areas that really impact tech integration, uh, we also wanna think about what kinds of content are we providing and what kinds of, of pedagogies are we, we really adopting uh, at the classroom level. So one of the questions that we asked as part of the survey was what instructional practices uh, are being used widely. And for these where you see something that looks like it's a, a column graph or a bar graph, that means that respondents could check more than one. So this is not gonna total up to 100%. That's how our pie and donut charts are, appear. So in this case, uh, when we look at different pedagogical practices, we've got differentiated learning as being uh, the top one that people said, most people responded they were using that. Blended and hybrid learning uh, came in second uh, as a pedagogical kind of approach. And then we have individualized, personalized, and flipped. And one of the conversations that Joe and I had while we were kind of going through the slides and thinking about what the data said is, you know, some of these, these terms and these tools tend to blend and they tend to overlap a little bit. So when we talk about differentiated instruction, how is that different from something like personalized learning or even individualized instruction? So when we think about it, you know, differentiated instruction, especially if you look at the work of Carolyn Tomlinson, that's really about looking uh, and supporting groups of students that might have similar needs and you know trying to really meet those needs at that level. When you think about blended or hybrid, that kind of speaks for itself, but flipped learning is often considered one of the constructs or one of the, uh, I guess, like approaches for blended uh, and hybrid learning. It's just a very specific approach, so we call that one out differently. Individualized, you'll often see that as it relates to something like computer-aided instruction, where a student logs in somewhere and they're really kind of guided through their, their learning progress based on their responses, like adaptive, where personalized learning really has to do with the, I guess, the presence of the student in that picture. Do they have some choices in how they're learning and are they able to advocate for themselves? We hear that with student voice and choice. So I wanted to call that out because these, I think these terms can be a little fuzzy. Nebulous Yes, is the word we used before. That's right. Yeah. I think individualized learning is, is um, it, differentiated learning and individualized learning are components of personalized learning in my mind. Um, or can be components of mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Um, so it's a, but it is a very nebulous thing. And I think a lot of people um, have trouble defining that. Yeah. And so even responding to a survey like this may have caused some confusion around what, what's being practiced. But I do think we're going to get some interesting insight as we look a little further here. Yeah. Um, well, I know we will. Yes. Uh, and there it is. Yeah. So something that we asked this year that was, uh, also really interesting was, you know, of those pedagogies that are practiced, which of these are most effective? So I'll let Joe take a look at uh, kind of what that revealed for us, because we kind of had a lot of discussion about about this particular slide. <laughs> I'm so. going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take everyone through a, a little journey that, that we had uh, <laughs> looking at, at this information and trying to make sense of it. Um, so there, we were looking at this and realizing that there's some incongruence with um, the effectiveness what's considered most effective and how often that or how, how often that is being practiced um, in education um, but as we were going through it we didn't know that we were really seeing that that much correlation or um, or causation um, what we did notice though which is a very interesting takeaway is that if you look at the purplish dots hopefully it shows up purple for for you and and the what would we call that Turquoise? I think it's turquoise. We'll call it turquoise. Light blue. Light blue. We'll, we'll go with turquoise. Um, if you look at that, those indicate the turquoise is a teacher and the, um, the, the purple is those that responded from one of those administrator uh, categories. And everywhere, each of these um, 
indicators show that teachers and administrators are aligned on what is considered the most effective practice. Um, interesting though, in some of those most effective practices that they're not congruent with, um, with the actual deployment and use of those practices. Right. And we didn't see that throughout the survey necessarily. This happened to be an area where we saw a lot of similarity in terms of the administrative perspective and the teacher perspective. So. All right, types of digital content used most. Yeah, so looking, taking a look at this, looking at the type of digital content that's being used mostly in, and this based on the responses from, from teachers, um, the type of digital content that's being relied upon heavily, Google Docs, Office 365 Docs, or other cloud-based collab collaborative solutions, um, those two are pretty dominant in yeah, the space. no surprise so, there. Yeah, we don't, you know, yeah. a lot of the ones that you were around or like a couple of years ago where right. people have just transitioned for right. a lot of good reason. Yeah. Uh, the interesting though, thing, though, that comes out of this after that is your your standard, you know, use of Google Docs in classrooms and, and Office 365 Docs is that there's still a very heavy reliance on the static PDF, the static Word documents and other static text-based resources. Right. Um, so the the practice is still heavy, heavily reliant mm -hmm. on i would even go back to that that sammer type model, model and and put that in a substitution um, area yeah so, so we um, we talked about this last year too i mean it's not surprising there's kind of a natural progression as you shift to digital resources some of that's due just to some kind of fiscal concern like sometimes the converting from text based static resources to digital that's a significant cost sometimes so it may not be a, a reflection of the desire to what, of what is used, but simply what's available um, mm -hmm. at a reasonable cost. Obviously, PDFs or docs have been around for a long time. Yeah, and and to echo what Kelly, Kelly's saying, the the transition or the, or the tra transitioning from a static based document into online digital resources is a whole skill set, right? Too, and that takes time to learn. So the cost for time, it's a mammoth undertaking. So right. um, it's a starting place for sure to keep using those. And it's a great thing to do to, to start bringing those resources in. And then right. as you progress, you can start learning how to convert and transition into uh, those digital resources. Right. Um, one of the interesting things that also came came out of this is, is that OERs have yet to catch on. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that that also might be regional. I mean, there are certain states where there's a really heavy the push or a focus on open educational resources and even statewide consortiums that are devoted to actually curating those and sharing those with uh, with their faculties across the state, and then others where that's not a practice. So it, this would be an interesting one to look at in terms of region or state response, just to see, do we see, you know, higher responses uh, in a place like California uh, where they had a, you know, open textbook initiative there, or even I believe Virginia also is a really heavy, um, I guess, a heavy state for OER. So I think what was interesting for me about this one is that almost all of these things, if you have an LMS, can actually live inside of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here at Schoology, we've got a really good integration with both Google and Microsoft. You can obviously upload PDFs and Word docs, and Joe was with the PD team for a long time. And wouldn't you say that initially when people get into Schoology, one of the first things they start to do is upload. Yeah. Yeah. Just what they had before. Yeah. And I think that's that's a great. I mean, I even recommend that. Yeah. When, when you're first getting started, just take everything that you got, everything that you use. If you're going to share it in a classroom with a yeah. student or share it as a resource to anybody, just put it on school. Yeah. Get it on there as, as a as a repository, as a, as a place where everyone knows if I'm not in class or I forgot to grab something from yeah. class, a physical asset. I now have an I, I I have that backed up right and then eventually you can once you've got those resources built out and they're supporting what you're currently doing mm -hmm. or what you've been doing then you can transition more into that um, enhancing your your learning with digital content right so I think you know one of the things that we want to talk about today is we did the survey to help people think about what they should really think about next or where things are going I think one thing this points to is we really still need a lot of professional learning around how do we then make that content really engaging for students and moving beyond um, that upload, you know, kind of that that initial phase of getting stuff into the cloud versus really having students interact with that in a personal way. All right, so we're gonna put all these uh, key takeaways into context, um, pretty much just summing up the points that we've made. Um, the biggest takeaways that, that Kelly and I felt that we pulled away from this, from this data. Um, 
going back to what teachers are talking about as far as far as a big challenge for themselves is juggling multiple tools. And as we both mentioned, and I said we were going to mention it down the line, we've done it a couple of times. An LMS to Schoology is designed specifically to help you with that. So um, that's it. But it still is an interesting key challenge for for a lot of educators um, that they're that they're still struggling with with juggling multiple tools and not unifying that experience into one learning management system. Right. Uh, student access is a top barrier for for digital uh, digital learning. Um, we've seen that as as what teachers are um, taking as as we're seeing as as a biggest challenge for students being able to um, to uh, to interact with digital learning. Yeah, and I think one thing we also talked about for that one is, um, you know, when we think about mobile technology. I think we also need to redefine how we're thinking about access for students. And I'm not saying that this means that all students have access at home, but I don't know if, if you've heard of the uh, Project Tomorrow Speak Up org surveys that have been going out since 2004 they've been really keeping a close eye on things like mobile technology and they haven't released this year's data yet that should be coming out relatively soon but last year there was a really interesting stat about you know something like 40 percent of k2 students having a smartphone so i think that you know that idea of student access uh, i think is going to continue to shift as mobile becomes much 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 more pervasive absolutely um, and just the idea that you're able to access any device anywhere, anytime, yeah. as long as you have that free Wi-Fi that I mentioned, yeah. um, or Wi-Fi in general, uh, it does improve access. access. Right. Um, and that's that's an important takeaway for that. Yeah. Um, and administrators and teachers are, and I, I find this to be, even though it's the most glaringly obvious uh, insight from that earlier slide that had the two colors of the teacher and the administrator, um, it passed both of us when we were looking at it. Yeah. Um, administrators and teachers are relatively aligned in their perspective of uh, perspective on effective pedagogies. Um, but again, those pedagogies might not be being used, mm -hmm. employed in, in instruction, right. um, which begs, begs a, lot, a lot more questions. Yeah. Okay, let's shift into the admin perspective. Again, admin meaning uh, leader in terms of instructional leader in most cases. We did have folks that were instructional, uh, like you might have someone who was like in charge of information systems or information technology, but the bulk of the administrators that answered were in a role like a superintendent, a principal, someone who was in charge of curriculum, PD, et cetera. So uh, some things that we noticed from our survey this year, uh, one of them was in building support of resources. So one of the questions we asked is, does your institution have a dedicated instructional, you know, technician or, or technologist uh, that is dedicated to just do that? And if you look at it, what was interesting here is we have, you know, almost 70 percent saying that they do have uh, tech coordinator staff uh, that's actually built in. But then, you know, we have a segment where it's like, yeah, no, but we have folks who fill in to fit that need. And I both Joe and I know what that is like, is mm. stepping in to fill on that need. Uh, and then we have some that still don't have that person dedicated. So that's just more of a point of information. I think that as we implement more and more digital learning technologies, having that 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 built in support is pretty critical. So and as as I've I mean, I, I worked in in I was a teacher. Um, I've done that support, like you just mentioned, um, without it being my my role. Yeah. Um, it's just an add on thing, but it's a great thing to do. Uh, but as I'm as I've been working with school districts across the country, um, I'm seeing that become more of a, of a of a normal thing to have, a normal role to have inside of inside of school districts. So it's becoming more prevalent across school districts where that, that's that role is being hired. So yeah, that's a good positive trend because it's a, it's a definite need. Right. Um, it's a full time job. Right. Um, also, we asked and this again goes to what kinds of resources are being provided. Uh, especially we're thinking about that admin perspective. So what types of devices are provided for students? You'll notice that when we asked this question, we gave some different responses because one-to-one -one can mean multiple things. So obviously the top thing here is shared carts of devices. So most institutions, at least that responded, have that in some capacity at their buildings. I know that in my perspective and in my background, one-to-one -one was not really a, wasn't an option uh, initially. And so we started with shared carts. I think that's a really common uh, kind of approach. But then a lot of schools also are one-to-one -one with students that can take those devices home. And also a chunk where it's one-to-one, -one, but it might be housed at the school. 
So it's not a shared cart, but this, the devices still stay at the school building. And some of that also, when you look at the report um, in that PDF, some of that also is going to be a little bit grade dependent. So it may be that we don't send those home with a certain grade level set of students. My instinct would say that K2, we might leave those at the building. But as we get closer to high school, middle school, they, they probably take them home. Uh, and then also in class, uh, desktop devices. You know, we still have computer labs and a need for those, especially for some of those specialized programs. So, yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm very intrigued, interested by BYOD being so as low as it is. I, yeah, I me think, too, actually. I think years ago that might have been quite a bit higher, probably up with the shared cards and devices. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder, I wonder if it's a downward trend. Yeah, yeah, um, something to look at for next year for sure. Yeah, I mean, we don't have that much further down to go. But. No. <laughs> <laughs> True. We'll see what Maybe happens. it bounces back up. Yeah. Who knows? All right. And then also we asked about uh, what is being used, like hardware wise. This was interesting to me because we had a you know a bond that we passed. And so we opted to go the Chromebook route, like many, many schools. But at the time, that was kind of unheard of. We were an early adopter back in the 2012 timeframe. So interestingly, we see Chromebooks near the top here. Uh, and again, you know, especially with stuff that's so available on the web. You can do so much just with a web connection and a browser anymore. Um, so, but we also have obviously still those desktops that are provided. We have iOS uh, devices, uh, Apple laptops, and then also, of course, we have Android tablets. Obviously, a smaller percentage, I think, obviously, iOS has really kind of dominated the tablet mm -hmm. um, mark, at least for K 12. But I'm a, I'm a slow, I'm, I'm long on, uh, on Surface. Oh, are you? Yeah, yeah, I was I was a slow adopter, but I, I don't have one. But I uh, I go to Best Buy and I play with them all the time. I have one. I'll bring it next time. They're they're awesome. Yeah, they they're are great. awesome. Yeah, um, great productivity tool too. Yeah. All right. All right, and then also we asked what types of digital resources were provided educationally, and interestingly, and this actually kind of surprised me that the PD resources were actually the top rated thing that was provided at the district level. Uh, also, obviously, productivity apps and tools when you can purchase something like O365 for all of your, you know, your whole district, including students and student licenses for at home. There are lots of, of providers that give that home license if, if, uh, if it's wanted. Publisher content, again, not too surprising. Uh, scope and sequence documentation. So maybe getting away from binders, oh. <laughs> putting that stuff up onto the cloud. Uh, but again, when you look at you know providing digital resources, it's another place where an LMS could really be helpful because so much of this can actually you know live inside of or work very closely with uh, something like a learning management system. Yeah, and I don't I don't think there's one thing in here that that shows up on this list that doesn't. Potentially fit yeah. in with, with, with an LMS yeah. technology. Yeah, I think you're right. All right, All right. so yeah, time for another poll. Uh, so we're going to put up uh, another question. This one again is uh, just going to be a another predictor question. So we're going to go ahead and ask, what do you think the top admin challenges were? Um, so we already looked at top teacher challenges. What about admin? And we'll give you just a couple of seconds to respond to that one. Okay, let's go ahead and close the poll. Let's see what the responses were. Interesting. Zero percent for implementing a new ed tech platform. Interesting. Well, that we did ask what they thought the top of getter was. So mm -hmm. um, nobody thought that was going to be top one, which <laughs> I think is interesting. Um, reporting uh, and assessing the student performance tied with providing relevant and effective PD. All right. Well, let's take a look at what uh, our admins actually did identify uh, as their top challenge. You ready? I'm ready. And it's providing effective PD, same as last year. So professional development continues to be a challenge for administrators and a priority of actually providing effective. And Joe and I had a conversation about, you know, how do we define effective, you know, PD? Because obviously we saw in a previous slide that we see a lot of fiscal uh, resources being devoted towards providing professional development resources. 
and yet this still continues to be a top challenge. Yeah, um, and we're gonna dig into that a little bit further, actually. Um, so we actually pulled some information from the survey where 84% of administrators agree that PLCs and professional learning network networks are effective for P P uh, PD. Um, that is a varying level of effectiveness. Um, and we had, wow, 6,600 respondents to that question. Um, one of the, the key takeaways from that is Schoology, uh, as Kelly and I were talking about it, we were thinking about what, what really what, what really prompted Schoology. And mm -hmm. Schoology, if there is a founding pillar at all, um, it's communication and collaboration. Right. Our founders, um, we're really focused on creating a collaborative environment for the sharing of resources and educational information. Um, so Schoology is directly uh, related to creating a collaborative environment, especially for PD. And I right. think that's a, it's a big area, having been around a lot of school districts that are using Schoology, um, whether it be they're going through an early, they're early on with their implementation, or they've been with us for five years or longer. Um, there are a lot that are still, there's still a, a gap where they're, looking to do PD um, in a more centralized way. Right. And there might be other systems that they're doing professional development through, um, but unifying that experience into one place, as we're going to see in a, in a second here, is uh, has a, a greater benefit. So Schoology can absolutely be used for to, to address um, the, I guess, the, the, the passion here for believing that PLCs and collaboration is effective for, for PD. Especially if it was a priority for administrators and a top challenge is providing effective PD. If we know that they also believe that collaboration is really critical to that effective PD, how do you leverage something like a digital platform to make that happen uh, maybe a little bit more consistently across the board? Yeah. And we're going to tell you. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we also looked at what types of PD are being offered the most in the organization to, from the organization respondent or respondents of the organization. Let me rephrase that. The organizations that the respondents are from. Um, so we found that periodic workshops are most common uh, across the board. Um, single session work, workshops are very common there. And as I was looking at this, uh, I was thinking about my time as a classroom teacher. Uh, and going through periodic workshops and single session workshops. Um, and a lot of what's happening in those, in, in historically, and I'm really talking from anecdotally from my own, my own experience, um, was that that's not job embedded. Um, the best practices that I'm trying to use for my students, those most effective pedago pedagogical practices are not actually being used in the adult learning side. And we, I think we all know that effective PD is ongoing. Mm -hmm. It's job embedded. Right. Um, it has data tied to it. Right. Um, and it's iterative. So if we're not try or doing those things in the professional development realm, then we're not getting the experience. We're not, it's not job embedded. So being able to put, do, do a lot of the things that we're trying to do with our students in that professional development mm -hmm. experience as well is is going to by default job at that um, and we're going to learn a lot of a lot of ways that we can benefit our pedagogical practice and actually employ those practices that are not that are seen as most effective but are really lagging behind right. um, and then we're also we also looking at this data it's potentially suggested the effect, effective learning practices noted earlier that we talked about are not being used for adults or staff i did just mention that um, but if they're not using those effective methods that and and it's job and it's not job embedded then they're not going to have the experience that's necessary to be to know what's successful right i think what kind of surprised me about this one well there were two things first there's been a lot of research about the uh really impactful use of instructional coaches and how that really changes the game in terms of instructional practice in the classroom and that's you know some research from holland horde and it's it's really shocking when you look at transfer of, of knowledge into classroom practice when you add a coach in, in addition to, you know, modeling and in theory and practice, it goes to like a 95% implementation rate versus like 5 to 10% for modeling and practice. So we know that's true, but having those coaches on hand to support teachers still provides challenges. Even if we know it's effective, sometimes it comes down to a staffing issue. But I'll be curious to see if this 
this number goes up because I think I'm hearing more about that coaching model spreading uh, wider and wider. The other thing that really I thought was interesting is look at where online and blended is on this list. And as Joe just mentioned, we saw, you know, we asked, you know, what are the effective pedagogies for student learning? And blended was number two after differentiated instruction. And yet here, in terms of types of PD offered, it's pretty low. Yeah, I, so, I mean, I think it's in a sense, it's a, it's a, it's an easy, easy, easy experiment. Yeah. You, you start doing more professional development mm -hmm. through blended learning right. and see if that increases. So yeah. We can take a look at that increase next year and hope for the best. If yeah. Everyone's going to start doing that. And again, if you're thinking about what does this mean for your own context and how do you take this information and think about what to do next year, if you're not doing high, hybrid or blended PD, pick some courses that you think it might be a good fit for. Because I think that when you can model that, then it really makes an impact at the classroom level. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And this is uh, this goes back to just really that job embedded piece um, that 40 per six of 46 percent of our respondents to this survey don't use the same learning management system as they do for in, in class as they do for P-Day. Right. Um, so they're not getting the experience of knowing what it's like to go through and, and be a student in, in a course um, to have that properly designed workflow, that properly designed experience as a student, and then being able to go then redeploy that in, in their in their own in their own courses. Yeah, I would say that the most successful districts that we work with uh, in terms of using Schoology are using it for PD and for student learning. And it's so important that we actually developed one of our district success routes around ongoing professional learning uh, as part of our Compass program because we we knew it was such a huge need is how do we get that really effective learning that we want to see happening with students happening also for adults. So this was surprising to me and yet not surprising, I guess. Surprising and not. Surprising yeah, and I, not at the same time. It makes no sense, but I agree. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we'll um, put all these takeaways into context, just covering uh, those insights from the from the admin side of things. Number one, I think um, well, all three of these are incredibly important, but PD resources, as we saw, were the most common form of digital educational resource provided by administrators to their teachers. But providing effective PD is still a top admin challenge of 2019, right. um, which begs a lot of questions uh, as to maybe we're just worried about providing effective PD, um, <laughs> even though we're spending a lot of time. Maybe it's um, self-fulfilling right. in that sense. But um, it's it's definitely an important question as is the are the digital resources that we're using are they effective mm -hmm. um, are they are they being used correctly um, those are questions that are definitely worth asking and, and looking into um, PD is not job embedding <laughs> I, I guess I, I typed in embedding because <laughs> I embed a lot of stuff into Schoology so, you, that's right um, yeah, I am the embedder you are the embedder um, so PD is not job embedding. It's not job embedded. Let's correct that. Um, it oftentimes, if you're especially, I mean, there are districts like Kelly and I both mentioned that are using and they're very successful in the use of Schoology, the implementation, the adoption rates of Schoology, because the teachers are also using it for professional development. When they're using it on a regular basis, um, they get better at it. They get more comfortable with it. And they see the things that can be done, and they and they feel more they feel more confident in the platform. Also, to see that administrators are modeling that for them, I think right. that's an incredibly important. Uh, aspect of things. Yeah. Um, if you as an administrator can start using Schoology to you know communicate a little bit more than 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 you're using just a couple things here and there that you might use Schoology for to enhance your or to unify your experience. Um, it's it's going to have a better it's just modeling that proper behavior. Yeah we actually have a blog posts on the Schoology Exchange blog about ways to approach PD as an administrator. And one of the big suggestions was even doing something like a book study. So if you do a book study and you want to have everyone, you know, talk about and have discussions around that, make some of that blended. Use an online discussion board. Uh, see if you can get people to interact with you outside of the, the school day and the contract day. And do it on their own time, too, kind of personalizing a little bit, and giving them some flexibility. Too. I mean, we even do it here at Schoology. Yes, we do. It's eating the dog food, as they say. <laughs> uh, and I, I, all of these, I think, well, most of these will relate back to it not being job embedded, but right. the most effective instructional practice for students that we mentioned earlier, those the ones that were listed as most effective are not being leveraged for professional development. Right. So if you have an example is blended learning, like Kelly mentioned. So if you can start implementing those uh, in professional development, teachers are going to become more comfortable, more right. confident with the platform. Right. 
All right, so we're going to move into our last kind of segment of the day, which is looking at just some general things about learning that we got from the survey. So we'll start with uh, some emerging trends in the classroom. This probably is not going to be too surprising, but there's a, a emphasis here on things that we might associate with STEAM or STEM. So, and remember, this is one where we could actually have respondents select multiple options here. So the question was really like, what kinds of things are you currently doing in your classroom? And so coding, uh, robotics, 3D printing, uh, game-based quests, those were our top four. Uh, and you know, one thing that Joe and I talked about was actually AR and VR. And I don't know, what was your take on that? Because I, I couldn't tell if I was surprised that AR was lower or that VR was that much higher. <laughs> so uh, I, it doesn't surprise me that AR is so much lower, especially because the the big ones, in, the big names in AR are like Microsoft with their mixed reality, Samsung's doing stuff, uh, Apple's invested a lot in AR. Yeah. Um, but the technology is just not there and it's not, it's, it's cool. Yeah. But it's, it's just cool. Yeah. Um, VR is a lot more accessible than AR, I think, right now, especially, and it's marketed better. Right. Um, you know, in comparison to some of the other things that are on here, like coding, like why do why do we see coding being emerging just as like the highest emerging trend in the classroom? The except the the availability of the resources that are out there. Absolutely. The free resources. You're gonna, I mean, Code Academy, Free Code Camp. There's yeah. just tons of stuff that's out there to facilitate that. Right. Code.org. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you go down to looking at virtual reality, I personally went out and bought a um, VR headset. I got an Oculus. I got a computer for it. I wanted to know what it was like to be in virtual reality so that I could start thinking about what interaction for learning design was like in that. Yeah. Uh, also because I like to play games. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, especially in virtual reality. Now, everybody in the company knows they heard me talk about it for like a month straight every single day. And then it died down because my head started hurting. Um, but with VR, it's it's not consumer ready yet. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it, even the stuff like Google Google uh, Cardboard, yeah. um, it's it's more consumer friendly. It's cheaper. Yeah. Um, but the the stuff that's being developed is not there. There isn't a full commitment to it. It's and still so, pretty limited. Yeah. Yeah. And software can do virtually anything. Good one. Um, Did you mean that? Was that? Did you say virtually? Virtually, no. That was an accident. <laughs> okay. But thank you for sure. for bringing it up. English teacher. Software can do a lot, and. Um, we're limited, I think, mostly in VR with with the hardware. Yeah. Um, it's just you're putting basically two monitors in front of your eyes, right. and, and, and we can only do so much with that right now. We'll get there, and then it'll get cheaper yeah. and cheaper and cheaper, and it's going to become something that I think is a mainstay. Um, but I, I think these these trends, I'm surprised to actually see virtual reality as high as it is. Right. Um, I think we'll see 3D printing go up too next year, just because you mentioned the you know availability of of hardware and cost. Mm -hmm. You know, when those first came out, it was crazy expensive and yeah. now it's getting much more reasonable so we'll keep an eye on that one for next year yeah all right so our next uh kind of learning trend we asked questions about digital citizenship we actually didn't ask this last year and we put this on and you know if again if you have looked at project tomorrow's speak up they also started asking questions about digital citizenship i believe for their 2017 survey so we asked you know are you uh, is your institution do you have a program that students are required to complete and looks like you know we have um, you know, 26% that said yes, that's a huge chunk where it's actually not. So either it's not, but we encourage it to be happening when it's possible or just flat out no. So that was interesting, especially think about the pervasiveness of devices and how many students have those now. Um, I'm hoping that we start seeing digital citizenship become a much uh, heavier focus. Um, but the, uh, the next part of this, uh, is actually, uh, you know, what topics uh, are of most concern. And what I thought was interesting here is that, you know, we hear so much about students not being able to discern fact versus fiction and that information literacy skills, you know, are really lagging behind. And yet, if you look at where the focus is and the concern from our respondents, at least, information literacy is really low. And what kind of broke my heart a little bit as an English teacher was look how low uh, creative credit and copyright is. You know, students feel like, and actually I don't know that we model that much better as teachers sometimes, yeah. but you know, at acknowledging someone else's intellectual property. So what, what I'm hoping is that as we go on, and I, I, I'm i not saying internet safety and cyberbullying aren't important, but I think we need to have a much more balanced approach to what we think about as digital citizenship, including information literacy and things about digital copyright and what does it mean to actually own something intellectually. So. 
And I think informational information literacy feeds into every, it's a component of every one of these things. Yeah. I think it's the building blocks for these other components to be successful. Right. Um, and when Kelly and I were talking about it before, uh, literally an hour ago, uh, <laughs> we, I mentioned that it's, it's the same thing for me, the same thing as learning a language, the same thing as learning an instrument. You got to learn letters, you got to learn the alphabet before you can spell a word. Right. And dig, digital information literacy to me is the, is, is the alphabet of all the other paragraphs that are in, and chapters that are internet safety and, and cyberbullying and digital right. footprint reputation. Right. Um, so I do hope, this is just on a personal note, that we see a lot more focus on information literacy yeah. um, in the future, because I think that that will support everything else kind of naturally. Yeah. And these categories, by the way, are from Common Sense Media. So they have their curriculum divided into these kind of core areas. Uh, and we actually have several resources inside the school, inside of some Schoology groups that are actually digitized materials. So, and our donut chart is not proportional oh. to the numbers. We'll fix that for next year. <laughs> All right. So, also, we asked about the digital learning benefits for students and faculty. Uh, of course, we uh, this is what we hope to see is that does it positively impact student growth and achievement? And I would say overwhelmingly. Uh, there is a somewhat to very much, you know, yes, that absolutely does have a benefit. Um, so we had Joe and I were talking about, you know, the 0.4% who are not at all. We we're trying to figure out, um, who, yeah, who who that would be. I mean, I I could see maybe saying very little, though I don't, I would not agree with that. But the not at all was, yeah, I was surprised. So we also asked about uh, the digital learning benefits actually for faculty growth and teaching effectiveness and. Kind of a similar picture here, and it might be that same 0.4%. Very similar. Yeah, very similar. Just 0.4% um, of these people are not good that day. <laughs> well, and if you look at it, we have maybe a little bit more skewing for somewhat uh, versus very much. But you know, that might also go back to the fact that we still see some lagging PD in terms of how to really effectively teach with technology. Yeah. So that might be part of the impact there. But we'll see if we can get that 0.4% down to zero. Uh, for next year. I'll just delete it. <laughs> Error of measurement. Uh, and then finally, impact of the LMS on teaching and learning. Obviously, you know, as uh, here at Schoology, we're obviously concerned about the way that uh, something like a learning management system can, you know, get rid of some of those barriers we identify today. But when we asked, and remember, you know, we had 70% of these folks that were not Schoology employees. We asked about the impact of an LMS on teaching and learning. Uh, again, pretty overwhelmingly that it was very or somewhat positively impacting teaching and learning. So it would be, I'd be curious to know about the no noticeable impact. When Joe, you were talking earlier about things that are substitution, if you're doing the exact same thing in your LMS that you were doing face-to-face, -face, I don't know that you'd see that, that much of an impact or a difference. Mm -hmm. I think it's when you start really leveraging things like blended and pacing and student choice that you then really begin to see that impact. I think it's also important to think about how you measure that too. True, um, agreed. You know, if, if when I'm trying things out with Schoology or really anything that I do, I try to set a benchmark or a goal for where, a goal for what I want to be able to do. Yeah. Um, and if I implement a new strategy, uh, I'll take a look at some of the how the objectives are met right and i'll set easy objectives for that so something if i'm in that substitution method where i'm taking the content that i have on static documents mm -hmm. and just putting it there well what's the benefit of doing something like that one of the benefits might be that students aren't coming up to me trying to get copies of resources if i can actually record data around that it's been effective right so i think setting um data set points around what you're trying to collect and see that that'll help you know whether or not it's being effective or not and setting a measurement around that yeah so uh we actually just to kind of wrap up uh, again we just finished talking about just learning takeaways um digital citizenship is being a little bit unevenly approached in terms of those major topics that were identified by common sense media areas associated with stem or steam are trending uh with folks that responded and then digital learning and lms use uh have positive impacts on teaching and learning and what i'd like to also kind of think about today is you know, as kind of a larger takeaway that when you do have something like a learning management system, a lot of these things uh, become much, much easier. So that was part of what we gained by looking at that survey was seeing that we're on the right track and that I think that we're really providing uh, schools and teachers with really some great tools that can really help them with digital teaching and learning. Absolutely. 
right. All right, so we're at the top of the hour almost. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us. And as a reminder, after the webinar concludes, you'll get an email that has a link to the actual recording so that you can enjoy this yet again with me and Joe. And then also we'll be sending you the full PDF report. Again, that has much more information in it than it has been disaggregated. It's definitely worth uh, kind of going through and looking, especially in light of the conversation we had today, seeing where some of those data points then were further broken down uh, based on role. All right, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate your time and happy Wednesday. And tell your friends. <laughs>